So we've been working with parallelograms. And then we got into the specific forms of parallelograms like rectangles and rhombuses and squares. And now we're moving into a different family than parallelograms. These are iso the trapezoids. And the definition of a trapezoid is it's still a quadrilateral, but now it has exactly one set of parallel sides, not two sets like parallelograms. As a result, there's not that much special about it. In fact, all we really get out of it is what we got from parallel lines, from our parallel lines unit, where we know that if this is a transversal across the two red parallel lines, then I know that these two angles are called what? What kinds of angles? Same side interior. And if they're parallel lines, then same side interior angles are supplementary. So these two would be supplementary. And if I were to then look instead at this transversal, it has nothing to do with these angles over here, but you do still end up with angles that are supplementary. These two purple ones would be supplementary. This green and this blue one are supplementary, but there's nothing related to the left and the right sides. Now, if we take this trapezoid and we make it a specialty form by recognizing that these two parallel sides can't be congruent, that would force it to be a parallelogram. But what if these other two sides were parallel, or excuse me, were congruent? So you have one set of parallel sides and the other side being congruent. Well, it turns out that this triangle would then end up being congruent to this triangle. And as a result, what we end up finding is that not only will this angle and this angle be supplementary, just as it was in a regular trapezoid, but this angle will now be congruent to this angle because of CP, CTC, which means that these base angles are also congruent. So you might remember our isosceles triangle theorem that said that if it's an isosceles triangle, then the base angles are the same. Well, we have a very similar one here. It just says that if it's an isosceles trapezoid, then you get two pairs of base angles congruent. These two are the same, and those two are the same. And then further, because these two triangles are congruent, what you end up with is this diagonal and this diagonal being corresponding parts of congruent triangles. Thus, the diagonals come out to be congruent. And lastly, this is actually more of a corollary. I've never used it as a theorem before. But if this bottom angle and this top angle are supplementary, and these two top angles are congruent, then that means that opposite angles are supplementary, which is kind of cool. So for today, what we're going to be working with is doing problems using these ideas. I'm going to do basically the left-hand side, leaving you the right-hand side as your homework. So first one, we're looking at this shape. We recognize that it has one set of parallel sides. Therefore, it's a trapezoid. We look to see if we have any information showing us that the non-parallel sides are congruent. We don't. Therefore, all we know is this is a trapezoid. And in a trapezoid, I should pretty much think about blocking out one half and just looking at those ones. Those two angles are same side interiors. So if I'm looking for angle M here, I could just say 87 plus M equals 180, so M equals 93. And then I can block out the other side and say with this transversal, K and 51 are supplementary. So K plus 51 is equal to 180. So K equals 129.
any questions on using trapezoids, non-isosceles trapezoids, to find missing numerical values? Okay, we can take that one more step. Now we've got an algebraic expression. Anytime you have an algebraic expression in X, you have to come up with an equation. You have to figure out how you put these things together. Hold on one second. Uh, okay, before I move on to this, somebody asked why I was blocking part of it out. <clears throat> and the reason I was blocking it out was to simply refer to the fact that in our trapezoids, I don't really care about this part. All I know is that these two are supplementary. And if I block out the other part, those two are supplementary. There's nothing that ties the left and the right together. So by blocking half of it out, I'm isolating my vision to what really is tied together. So for example, when I'm trying to create the equation for this expression, I see that these are my two parallel lines. So I've got one transversal over here with no information, so I may as well just block that out. And then one transversal over here with these two expressions. One is a purely numerical expression, one has X in it. And I know that the relationship between these two is supplementary. So the equation I would write is the sum of those equals 180. Oops, off screen a little bit there. So 8X plus 60 equals 180. So 8x equals 120, so x equals 15. Please note that in this case, it only asked us to solve for x. In your equivalent problem, it's asking you to take it one more step to solve for r. So you'll have to plug that x value in and solve for that. We'll be doing that in a couple of our future ones as well. So these are both trapezoids. Again, very limited things you can do with those. Now we're looking at some isosceles trapezoids and they're basically asking us for some congruence statements. Notice that since we're using congruence, we won't be putting numbers in here, right? Congruence is for use of uh, geometric objects. So if we've got a segment congruent to something else, it has to be another segment here. Well, they're saying DG is congruent to what? If this is isosceles, we expect the opposite side over here to be the same size or congruent. I'll put EF and I'll make sure that I mark it as a segment by putting a segment over the top. <clears throat> Second one says, yeah, well, what about DF? And we say, okay, well, DF is a diagonal. It goes across the center of the shape. And as a result, I'm asking myself, what do I know about diagonals and my isosceles trapezoid? And my response, of course, is that diagonals become congruent. So whatever size DF is, GE is the same size. So GE would be congruent. Last question for this page. They're giving me a number now. So I'm going to be solving for numerical values. <clears throat> they only gave me one number, which might make you think about blocking half off, like I said. But because this is an isosceles trapezoid, we've actually got this symmetry. The left and the right fold over each other and are the same. So if this is 112, how big is the measure of angle Q over here? 112. Yeah, those are going to be the same. Which means that when we figure out what S is here to find out what's supplementary, 112 plus S equals 180, S equals 68. That's going to give us some benefit because if this is 68 here to make supplementary, then that's also 68 here to make supplementary. And this jives with what we know about base angles being congruent, top and bottom. Okay, page two is slightly more challenging problems. Do this first one together. 
it's giving us MP and NO and PN and MO, and each of these is algebraic expressions. And for some people, this gets stressful, right, to think about what this all means. But just be careful with what you're given here. So MP is what? A side, an angle, or a diagonal? Side. Sure, it's a side. So let's find the other one that's a side. Well, it's actually right next to it, NO. And what do we know about those sides in an isosceles trapezoid? They're congruent. They are congruent. And the definition of congruence would tell us that if they're congruent, then their measures are the same. So I'll take these two expressions and I'll set them equal to each other. And then I'll just solve this like an algebra expression or equation. I'll subtract 9x from both sides. I'll add 13 to both sides. And I get x is equal to 3. And then I'll do the same thing with the other information they give us. They give us that Pn is equal to 5y plus 19. And that Mo is equal to 12y minus 37. Well, what are those? Angles, sides, or diagonals? Diagonals. Yes. And what do we know about diagonals in an isosceles trapezoid? They're congruent. Good. Our choice is either going to be to set them equal to each other or to add them together to make something else, right? So in this case, we're going to say they're congruent. And then we'll solve that algebraic expression, excuse me, equation. So I'll minus 5y and I'll add 37. That's going to be 56 is equal to 7y. Divide by 7 and I get that y is equal to 8. How's that feel to you? Please give me a feedback in the chat. One through five. Five is this is easy. Love it. Give me lots of these. Three. I think I can do these. I just have to be careful. One. This is hard for me. Excellent scores. Okay. Um, what would you do with this one? I'm not going to do this one for you, but what would you do with those two angles? What is their relationship? They equal 180. 50 50 chance, right? Either they're equal to 180 or they're equal to each other. So are the parallel lines forming the river for these two? In other words, is this the transversal with these two parallel lines? Or are these the parallel lines where theoretically I could block it off if it were not an isosceles? So these are the base angles. These should be congruent. So you'll set these equal to each other. These are the ones where you'll add them together at equal 180, make them supplementary. Because they've got the parallel lines and the transversal is the shared side among them. In this case, one of the parallel lines is the shared side. So if this is the case, you'd say, well, I see that these are my same side interior angles. That means supplementary, which means that I can add these two expressions together, equaling 180, and then I combine like terms. Add 16 to both sides. I know that 196 is 14 squared, so divide by 14, and I get x equals 14. But oh no, that's not the end of it. They're making me go further. They want me to find the value of angle J. Well, the measure of angle J says I take 10 times whatever X is minus 33. Well, we've just found that X is 14. But for angle J, we take 10 times 14 or 140 minus 33. So the measure of J is 107. And if that's 107, which other one is also 107? Angle K. Good. Because those are what are called base angles. I know it's a little odd to have base angles on top, but remember in the world of geometry, we can theoretically be flying around in space. 
we could be upside down relative to this. So those are our base angles. <coughs> and then if I want to find, for instance, angle L, I would just say that the measure of angle L plus 107, these two are in a supplementary relationship. So the measure of angle L would equal 73. And if I know that's 73, then I know this is 73 as well, because it's isosceles, only because it's isosceles. Any questions on that? Okay, we'll leave the rest of this page for your homework. And now we're moving into our last shape of the day. It's a kite. And I don't know if you guys have any experience with kites. Um, many years ago, I tried to get creative on a date when I was in San Francisco, 25 years old, and I invited the woman to go down and make handmade kites at the Marina Green. And it was kind of a fun idea, but boy, it was harder than I thought. So I figured that it should look something like this. And at this point, I need you to tell me, what is a kite? What are the attributes that make this look like a kite? Because that's the definition of a kite. Did I have to be precise about any of these measurements or is it just kind of like, whatever? give you the ability to communicate with specificity. Um, segment KE is congruent to segment TE and segment KI is congruent to segment IT. Excellent. So a kite is a quadrilateral with two pairs of not opposite sides congruent, two pairs of consecutive sides congruent or adjacent sides. And I got that, but Turns out that's not really where it comes from. You're building a kite, as I discovered. It actually comes mostly from what happens here with these like cross beams that go in the center. What has to be true about those? They form right angles. Yes, they must be perpendicular which in real life is pretty challenging to not only find exactly perpendicular, but to take two round sticks and tie them or glue them together in some way that makes them stay perpendicular. What else? There's one other thing about how those were arranged. They form vertical angles. Uh, they do, good. I was actually putting a point X there to give you the ability to communicate KX as a segment length has to be the same as XT. You need this to be bisected this way, but not this way, which is a little bit odd. And so as I start to fill in the truths, the things that are true about a kite, it quickly gets a little bit overwhelming. So for example, it turns out that this angle and this angle will be the same, but this angle and this angle will not be the same. This angle gets bisected, so those are the same, and this does too, but these do not. So it's a lot of yes and no. The way I remember this is instead to think about these triangles. And maybe this is just because when I was doing this with my date, it collapsed right in the middle and it folded in half and I got to see very easily visually what it looks like when it folds up like that. Because I used balsa wood, which I thought was great because it was light, but no, that's not strong enough. Um, so what we see then is that these two sides are the same. These two sides are the same. And of course, the central axis is reflexive, so it's the same which means this left side and the right side are congruent triangles, which means that these angles, as they flip over, are corresponding angles, CPCTC, so they're the same. And so are these little parts. 
and these parts. And even as you'll learn later, when I take the altitude of a triangle going perpendicular up to a vertex, since these triangles are congruent, the altitudes will also be the same. And most important element of today's discussion on kites is that the most important part of a kite is the tail. I didn't realize that until I was out there building kites and I realized, oh, when I put some drag on there, this actually flies well, otherwise it endos. Anyway, so now what we're going to do is do a little bit of talking about the properties of kites. And as I've just described, there's a bunch of them, but I think it's easiest to visualize these two triangles folding over each other. They are congruent. So any corresponding part of yellow and pink that match up are going to be congruent. So what about for problem number one? I see two angles given to me, and I'm looking for two other ones. It kind of seems like there's not enough information. Could it be that they all all add to um, 360 and then um, angle ABC is congruent to ADC. Beautiful. That's exactly right. So this angle, we'll call it X, and this angle, X, are the congruent ones, right? B and D are the same size. And we know that because this is a quadrilateral, heard an awful math joke yesterday. I'm going to throw it right in here. Because it's a quadrilateral, it's overeducated. You know why it's overeducated? Because it's got 360 degrees. You know, like a bachelor's degree, a master's. Okay. Anyway, so once I get that these four things all together add up to 360, I can say that 85 plus 2x plus 43 equals 360. So 120, 2x plus 128 equals 360 which means 2x equals 132, so x equals 116. Each of these is then 116 degrees. The second problem is a little more challenging. It's now got the diagonals in there which means we're bringing in not just that one pair of angles is congruent, we're also talking about the bisected ones. So let's start with the low hanging fruit. What do I know about PTQ? It's equal to QTR. Uh, good, it is equal to QTR, nice. You're thinking about the congruent triangles and since they're also a linear pair, that means that it must be 90 degrees or a right angle. It's the only way they can be both supplementary and congruent. So this is 90 degrees. And then it wants us to find PQT, this one over here. Any ideas? Well, triangles add to 180 and you have two of the angles. So 90 plus 37 plus X is equal to 180. Very good. They do make a triangle since I know this one is 90 and this one's 37. Adding in the third angle will equal 180. I get 127 plus the measure of angle PQT equals 180, which means the measure of angle PQT equals 53. And then they want QRT, this one here. Do we have a bunch of calculations to do with that? Or is that kind of a slam dunk? about the congruent triangles. Is it also 37 degrees? 
Good, it is. Remember it folds over the middle here, so it would overlap exactly with map onto 37. Therefore, it's congruent. Okay, what I'd like to ask now is for you guys to take a few minutes independently and try to answer as many of these as you can, and then we'll come back and go through them together. Go. <clears throat> so in this problem, we recognize that three is 90 degrees because it's the intersection of two diagonals. And that means that each of these is 90 degrees. We can then get some horn honking in the background. We can then get some uh, low hanging fruit by recognizing that since this yellow triangle is congruent to this triangle, that 65 will map over to here. So angle four is 65. And we know that this 52 will map up to here. So angle seven is also 52. And then somebody just suggested that we use a triangle angle sum to say that 90 plus 52 plus the measure of angle five equals 180. Therefore, we can get that the measure of five is equal to 38. And then angle six, as a reflection of that, is also 38. Now, what I was just going to suggest is that for us to find, for example, the measure of angle one, we could use this same triangle angle sum theorem, say 90 plus 65 plus the measure of angle one equals 180. But there were some corollaries we learned with the triangle angle sum theorem, one of which was if it's a right triangle, then the non-right angles are complementary. In other words, rather than writing 90 plus 65 plus the measure of angle one equals 180, we know that every single right triangle is going to have that 90 in there. So if we just subtracted that first, we get that the remaining two angles have to add up to 90. And then I could have skipped this step and just said, these two equal 90, these two equal 90, these two equal 90, these two equal 90, leaving us that the measure of angle one is equal to 25. And of course, if angle one is equal to 25, so is angle two. One more on this page. We know that WX is equal to 14 and WR is equal to eight. And we're looking to find RZ. Offhand, they don't look like they have any, any relation together at all. But it is a kite, so we get those right angles. We also know that this one is diagonal, excuse me, this part of the diagonal is congruent to that part of the diagonal. And we know that if this is 14, so is this. So I've got a little right triangle here. This part is eight, this is 14, and what I'm looking for is RZ. And if I have a right triangle with one missing side, whose theorem do I get to use? Pythagorean. Yeah, he paid for that patent, so we gotta use his name often just to give him credit for that. So we're gonna say eight squared plus RZ squared equals 14 squared. So 64 plus RZ squared equals 196. So RZ squared is equal to 132. So RZ is equal to square root of 132. And I'd be okay with that as an answer. Or you could give us a decimal approximation of that. Square root 132, 11.49. And again, to ensure that that's an approximation, I show my squiggly equal sign. Any questions on these properties of kites? Okay. So this last page is more about kites. And I'm going to leave most of this with you. Let's see. What are we going to do with these? We've got expressions, algebraic expressions, so we have to create an equation. It's usually added up to something or set equal to each other. What about these?
sine and equal to each other? Yeah, because opposite angles, these opposite angles are congruent. So 13x minus 32 equals 7x plus 22. I'm going to leave that, the rest of that for you. What about 13? Are these two equal to each other? No. No, they're not. But what do we know about B and D? They're equal. So this is the overeducated kite, isn't it? It's got 360 degrees. 109 plus 5x plus 14 plus 109 plus 3x plus 8 equals 360. So 218 plus 22 is 38, 242 plus 8x equals 360. And I'll let you finish that off. So you guys can keep working on that one for a moment. I'm going to organize your breakout rooms. I'm going to put you into breakout rooms to work on this. Um, in the event that you'd like to continue to use the breakout rooms we've had in the past, you may. I'm going to put it in the link here in case anyone would like to make a change. So I can find it. There it is, a chat. Okay, so feel free to go in there and <clears throat> add your name to a purple group. I'd love to see you do it. I think you'll have better luck with it um, and do some learning with that. So if you want to throw your name into a purple group, we'll see if we can put you in with some other people in purple groups. Okay, I'm gonna open these rooms up and I'd like you to spend the next, what do we have, about 25 minutes working on these sheets, filling in the problems we didn't do. This is your homework that you're starting as well. <laughs> 